Hey, this is Doc G. Before we get into this episode, I just wanted to mention that this is a conversation that's hard to have. It's a conversation about financial abuse of women. And look, I've seen the stats on our podcast, Earn and Invest. We are about 70% men and 30% women. So it's possible that 70% of the people listening to this podcast right now have never dealt with these issues. I guess I just wanted to say that Even if you're not a woman, we may be talking about your wife here. We might be talking about your daughter. We might be talking about your best friend. I think this conversation is important for all of us to have. I hope you enjoy it. Take a listen. Welcome to the Earn and Invest podcast on Fireside Chat. We have the conversations that help you earn and invest in your future so you can make the right decisions today. I'm your host, Doc G. And for this episode, we're going to talk about something rather difficult specifically financial abuse against women. To help us get started, we are joined by two amazing expert panelists. Kitty was born in the American Midwest, but was voted off in season 17. Her wan complexion, intellectual elitism, and gay haircut are all way more welcome in New England, so she lives there now. She shares her life with her partner and 12 pets because she does not do half measures. She is co-host and co-creator of all things Bitches Get Riches, including the blog and podcast. Kitty, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Doc. It's awesome to be back in the in the Doc headspace. I am so excited to have you here and have this conversation that, granted, may not be easy, but is important. We are also joined by Diana Miriam. She is an ambitious marketing professional with a passion for building brand longevity through strategic licensing partnerships and brand extensions. She started the Economy Conference as a passion project rooted in the FIRE movement, that is the Financial Independence Retire Early movement. The inaugural event happened on March 7th, 2020 at the University of Cincinnati with nine expert speakers exploring the concept of a new American dream. She is also the voice behind the Optimal Finance Daily podcast. Diana, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much for having me, Doc. And Kitty, can you please rewrite my bio? (laughs) You know, copywriting comes really easily to me when I have very little incentive to care too much about what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. You're, it's hilarious. I absolutely enjoyed that. And I was just <laughs> thinking, man, I need to step mine up. <laughs> anytime, anytime. I'm available for freelancing, I'm sure. So today we're going to start with something A little more difficult, this is a Twitter thread put out by our mutual friend, Paula Pant. She is one of the biggest voices in personal finance today. The Twitter thread begins, tweet one, many years ago, I was in an abusive relationship. He hit me repeatedly. He pushed me into walls. He punched me in the face. He clamped his hand over my mouth so that I couldn't scream. And then he hit me over and over and over. Now he's trying to silence me through a lawsuit. Tweet two. You see, he convinced me that I was quote unquote bad. He told me I deserved to get punched. He told his ex-girlfriend that he was hitting me and she said, that doesn't sound like you at all. And he used that to convince me that the problem is me. He's not a hitter. I'm just hittable. Tweet three. Then he convinced me to put a bunch of assets in his name. He said that if I had them in my name, I'd make a mess of things because I'm bad. He should have them because he's good. He convinced me of this, and so I did. Tweet four. When our relationship ended, he claimed those assets were entirely his and his alone. He pressured me into making a lopsided agreement, one in which I kept a fraction of what's truly just and equitable. He robbed me of years and years of my life's work. Tweet five. He also made me sign a non-disparagement agreement in order to keep my lopsided sliver. That's why I can't tell you his name or specify when this relationship took place or what type of assets I'm referring to or give any other identifying information. Tweet six. This day, he continues to use his lawyers to bully me. If I breathe a word, he claims that I'm violating the non-disparagement agreement and he contacts his lawyers who contact my lawyer and I get a nasty letter threatening legal action. Tweet seven. I'm sure he'll see this and he'll have his lawyer send another threatening letter claiming a violation of the non-disparagement agreement, despite the fact that I haven't said anything identifying, but I am so sick of being silenced by my abuser. Tweet eight. 
I should mention something else, something that's hard for me to write. He also sexually assaulted me on multiple occasions. I'm writing this shortly after getting off the phone with a rape crisis center. I've decided to file a report, even though it has it was years ago. Tweet nine. I'm exhausted every day from the knowledge that he hit me, raped me, robbed me of years of my work and years of my investments, and then pressured me into signing an agreement that muzzles me. Tweet 10. I'm exhausted from the reality that the legal system won't help me to the contrary. He convinced me to list assets in his name so that he could use the legal system to bully me, to steal from me, and to emerge as the victor. Tweet 11. I am exhausted, and I will not be silenced anymore. I won't tell you his name or identity, but I will speak my truth. And the truth is that I'm a domestic violence survivor and a sexual assault survivor. I'm a robbery survivor, and I will continue to speak out. End thread. Let's let that sit for just a moment before we start talking about this. Kitty, I want to begin with you. Tell me your first impressions after reading this thread. You know, the first time that I met Paula was basically the first time I was meeting anyone in the personal finance sphere. We had just started Bitches Get Riches in in January of that year, and we were up for a couple of Plutus Awards in our first year, which was incredible. So we were like, we got to go to this this FinCon thing, I guess. Uh, They might be giving us an award. It sounds like a lot of fun. And so we we went for that first year and on like maybe day two, I don't remember who had like sort of grabbed us and said, come to this hotel room at this time. And we walked inside and sitting on every surface, like on the radiator, on the floor, on the bed, on the desk, there were probably 20 women all crammed in who were just the best of the best in the personal finance sphere. And they were just going around the room saying, here's what's up with my business. Here's what I've, here's what I've tried that's worked really well this year. You know, saying here are the big problems I'm working on and just helping each other. And it was an electric, like magical feeling because in so many ways, everyone in the room was sort of a competitor with each other, right? Like we're all writing for, you know, essentially the same demographic, the same audience talking about very similar topics. But it was just this outpouring of very focused and thoughtful mutual support. And Paula was there and she was like sitting on on the bed with like six other women. And she was just spilling all of these like what I would consider to be like hard won secrets about how to be successful and what works and 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 what what challenges her and just throwing out so many ideas to these young new content creators. And that was such an incredible way to meet her. And I I was just immediately blown away. Like, wow, this is like a different, a completely different little secret community within a community within a community of women helping each other. And the fact that that's how I first met Paula, I think really speaks to how shocking and upsetting it is to be reminded of something that I already know, but kind of constantly relearn, which is that the people who you think are susceptible to abuse, you're incorrect. Everyone, no matter how successful, no matter how confident and strong, no matter how generous and no matter how capable and entrepreneurial, everyone is capable of being controlled, of being lied to, of being hurt. And I'm really impressed with the bravery that she had in coming forward. I think she's setting a wonderful example for a lot of other people. And my experience is that whenever someone prominent within any community comes forward with this kind of story, it empowers a lot of people who who see themselves and think, oh my God, if it could happen to her, I'm a lot less ashamed that it also happened to me. So that's kind of my my first takeaway hearing that. Diana, it was shocking, not just what the thread said, but who was saying it. Tell me your first impressions as you read through this. I was really surprised. I, you know, thinking about how I first met Paula, 
I met her through, she's very active within World Domination Summit. I've seen her talk on the main stage. She did a really powerful speech on authenticity. She's done breakout sessions about finances. I met her in person at Camp Fi and Camp Mustache. I've always just had this impression of her as this strong, independent woman. And I think a lot of us have this misconception, just like Kitty hit on that, you know, that something like that couldn't happen to a strong, independent woman. And so I really appreciate that she, that she spoke out about it because, you know, even after reading it, I started Googling, like, how does this happen? How do we prevent it? You know, what is this about? And I read that, Financial abuse is one of the least discussed forms of cruelty, <laughs> and it it's really paired like 100% of the time. If you are in a violent situation or other kinds of abuse are usually paired with financial abuse because it's all about control. And so my first impression was shock, but also appreciation because I think someone in Paula's position speaking out about this causes all of us to think about it more. One of the most moving statistics that I've seen about financial abuse that really just made me like come to a full stop and think really deeply about how I could use my my tiny little platform to help people is 99% of domestic abuse includes financial abuse. Any kind of intimate partner violence, you know, physical violence, sexual assault, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, isolation, gaslighting, blackmailing, manipulation, all of these things, the most common form of intimate partner abuse is financial abuse. 99% of people surveyed. That's absolutely incredible, which makes me think that our, our definition of abuse, I think, has often been kind of colored by this, this kind of PSA vision of like a sad, crying woman with like a black eye who's cowering in a corner. And there are victims of abuse who do look like that. But actually, if you follow it back, the, the number one most common thread running through intimate partner uh, abuse is controlling your money your access to money. And that is something that is so supported and upheld by our society's strange obsession with not talking about money and not being open about finance. And I have always believed in tearing down that wall as much as possible and making it something that it's fine for, for people to, to talk openly and confidently about but seeing the power that the personal finance space has to really chip away at this sense of silence. It just like really, it, it made me see the ways that we can do so much real good in this space. Kitty, it's, it's an amazing, stunning number. 99%, 99% of abuse cases have some form of financial abuse associated with them. I mean, the Bitches Get Riches universe is full of empowered women. Are people talking about this stuff? I would say that this is a topic that does get discussed. We, we've written about it quite a lot. And anytime the topic does come up, stories just come pouring out. I think what's important is that people kind of have to feel a sense of safety in order to come forward. And that sense of safety requires like kind of a, a non-judgmental attitude. There's so much shame. There's so much shame for people who have survived intimate partner violence and domestic abuse. They're one of the reasons that I, I think a lot of people struggle with like, well, why do people stay in these relationships? And there are many very complicated reasons. And two of the biggest ones are financial reasons. It's really hard to disengage yourself if you live with a partner, if you share accounts, if you share cars, if you're on leases or mortgages with each other. That's that's a big thing. But also then the, the fear of violence afterwards. 75% of women who are killed by their partner are killed after they have left them. So it, it's something that like 
there's so much shame involved and and another contributing factor is this this shame where where people feel embarrassed and i'm sure that you know although i don't think that paula used the word like ashamed or embarrassed in her tweet like it comes through right this sense of like i let this happen or i let this go on or i was i let myself be tricked by this person and that sense of shame you have to create a safe place where people feel like they're not going to be judged for their financial decisions. They're not going to be judged for the choices that they made in the past. And unfortunately, I would say that the personal finance sphere sometimes it has been too judgmental, too quick to kind of look at people's budgets and their spending and all these things that people are being very open about and say like, oh my gosh, you're spending so much on this. So why aren't you investing in this way? And that I think does kind of like pump the brakes. So it, it it's it's a thing that we talk about a lot and we try to talk about a lot and people are clearly eager to to listen and share their experiences but i think we also have to work harder as a community to build an environment where people feel like they can say what they need to say diana we're all familiar with the me too movement which brought to light more of the physical and emotional abuse suffered by women in modern society do you think we missed an opportunity to also talk about financial abuse? It didn't seem like it was a huge part of the conversation back then when Me Too started. No, it wasn't. You know, when I was looking at Me Too and when, you know, all of these kind of stories started coming out, I didn't see financial abuse as part of it. And and again, it's it's so intimately linked that it should be a part of the conversation. What, what I've gotten out of this thread and even in like the Facebook groups that are geared towards women and personal finance, you see these stories come up a lot of, you know, I found myself in this situation, you know, how do I get out of it? And time and time again, it just kind of reiterates for me that everyone needs to have their own money, especially women. And I think that there's this narrative and you see it a lot like even within Dave Ramsey content i remember there was this tweet or something that was put out there that was talking about how like when you are married everything should be 100% combined because this is a partnership and you know there are some people that agree with that there are people that strongly disagree with that i personally strongly disagree with that because again i think everybody needs their own money and especially women so I, I would say that I don't think that it's, it's talked about nearly enough. I just read um, a, a post recently from Tanya Hester, and she said something that just like, I was like, ooh, this is going to be a shower thought for me for the next week. She was talking about divorce specifically and how it's often viewed as like very unromantic to talk openly about like, should we have a prenuptial agreement? Should we have a, a written agreement about how we would divide our assets in in the case of a breakup or a divorce? And since that's something that was sort of central to what, what Paula's situation is, where she felt she was sort of strong-armed into a deal that worked a best, uh, against her best interests. And, and what Tanya said was, there's nothing more romantic than having those discussions beforehand because you don't want finances to be the reason that you and your partner stay together. And what could be more romantic than planning together so that the reason that we want to stay together always is because we are in love and not because it is very inconvenient for us to, to separate. And I was like, Oh, wow, that's, Tanya, she's bringing the thunder. Yeah, I I really appreciate that, Kitty. And you just made me think one of the other impressions that I got from this thread from Paula is that it really appeared as control disguised as protection, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Let me do this for you. Mm-hmm. Let me handle this for you because I know more. And I, I think that's why it can kind of go under the radar or people find themselves in these situations before they even realize it's happening because it's so subtle and it's disguised as something else like, oh, he's helping me with my finances. 
Well, what are the red flags around that, right? Like if he's saying, let me do that for you, that's very different than let me share some books with you on personal finance because I 100% know that you can do this yourself. And I want to empower you to do this on your own, not let me do that for you. It, it's, it's a subtle distinction, but I think it's one of those things that we really need to have to, we really should look out for. hundred percent. And, and I think that the easiest way for someone who's never been in um, an abusive relationship to kind of think about it is that fundamentally all forms of abusive relationships are just coming from the desire to control the other person. And sometimes the way that you control that person is through through physical violence, through, through punching and, and kicking, which in many ways is like almost it's easier to understand. It's easier for people on the outside to understand, ah, that's abuse. That's what abuse looks like, right? But really any action that you could use to control a partner or a family member or, or, or an employee, any abusive relationship is just a quest to do whatever you have to do to use whatever tool is at your disposal to control the other person. And so of course, finance is like one of the absolute easiest ways to do that. And I see that in like abusive workplaces, toxic workplaces, where they know that their employees are are desperate. I see that in family situations where parents will use the fact that they know that their child who's maybe late high school or just starting out in, in college and can't support themselves. And so they'll make unreasonable demands of that child because they know that they kind of have them cornered using money. But it's people using money the same way that they might use fear or social isolation or sexual assault or, you know, just any one of these tactics. They all work and they are all to the same goal, which is complete control. Let's take a short break. We're talking to Kitty from Bitches Get Riches and Diana Miriam from the Economy Conference. And the topic for today is financial abuse against women. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to all of you listening that I am not a real estate expert. Certainly, I have some rental properties that I use as a form of diversification in my overall investment strategy. Yet if you want to really know how to use this asset class, I suggest you go over to the Real Estate and Financial Independence podcast with Coach Carson. Here he as the expert tells you all the tips and tricks to use real estate to head towards financial independence. He also has episodes where he has guests, real life examples, people who have used real estate to reach their financial independence dreams. Check him out at CoachCarson.com. Again, that's CoachCarson.com. It is the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. Take a listen. You won't regret it. Diana, a little while ago, you were talking about separating finances in a marriage, and you said something to the extent of especially women should have their own bank account it begs an important question. When we're talking about financial abuse, is this something usually men do to women? Is that kind of how we frame this conversation? I think that's how we look at it for the most part. I'm sure that it goes the opposite direction as well. I don't have any stats on that. But I think it's whoever is holding the power, right? And whoever is in the position to manipulate someone else, whether it's a man or a woman, that's where we can see that these dynamics come out. You know, it occurred to me just kind of society, how we think about relationships. We kind of think about it as the joining of these two people and you kind of, you know, it, it, it's almost like it feels like this loss of independence when you partner up with someone else. But I like to think of marriage as almost like a joint venture, as, as like a business relationship. If two businesses are deciding to come together in a joint venture, they are completely independent on their own. And there's a strong reason why joining forces makes, you know, the both of them combines better than they would be on their own. And I wonder if we could start thinking about marriage in that way, where you're not that you're marrying another person because you're dependent on them, but it's two self-sufficient 
people coming together to, you know, leverage each other's strengths versus needing the other person. That's kind of what struck me when I was thinking about just how this happens in relationships. I, I want to agree with you, Diana, and and Doc, to, to your question. So I have a, a few personal experiences with intimate partner violence and high control relationships. Luckily, none of them were mine, but, you know, people that I've known personally and kind of seen them throughout the entire stage of the process, getting into this terrible relationship and then finally coming out on the other side. I want to say very strongly that although I think by the numbers, women do tend to be the victims of uh, intimate partner violence at much higher rates. I think financial abuse in particular, along with like sort of quote unquote, like softer forms of abuse, absolutely women are capable, more than capable of, of being abusers themselves. Men can be victims and, and there are many male victims uh, of financial abuse. I have no doubt whatsoever about that. I have a personal friend who was a a cisgender woman in a relationship with a transgender man and the transgender man was very abusive and controlling of her including and especially financially and i think in many ways that person who had this sort of cover as oh well i'm part of an oppressed group so i can't be uh the powerful one in the relationship right I must be the good one because I'm part of this group that is historically marginalized. Abusers are really, really, really clever when it comes to making themselves seem like they're not powerful, seem like they're not in control, to seem like, to build a narrative where it seems impossible that they could be the one who's acting badly. And I'll also say I have had in my life exactly one panic attack And it was when I was the sole breadwinner for a house with four people in it. My husband was going through a career transition. So I said, don't worry about it. I will make our income cover both of us. And then we had two friends who were going through a tough time who were crashing with us temporarily. And the reason I think I had that panic attack was the overwhelming pressure of needing my job to go really well because so many people were depending on me. And that moment, I think more than any other, gave me a really strong sense of, oh my goodness, this is a feeling that men must have, right? This this sense of I'm expected to provide for this family that I had built for myself. And that moment was such a flash of insight to me in terms of a an emotional need that typically has been shouldered by men that really like just isn't talked about at all. So I I think there's, there's like a gender aspect where, yes, I want to acknowledge the vast majority of, of abuse does tend to happen to the less powerful person and the less powerful person often tends to be the woman in the relationship, but there is no telling. And sometimes from the outside of a relationship, what can seem like, oh, person A must be the the strong one and person B must be the weak one, you know, the scare quotes around all of that. But really, it's very hard to tell what goes on uh, behind closed doors of a relationship. The dynamic can be completely different. And sometimes the abuser will intentionally make it easy to misinterpret that. Diana, I think this is a good time to move on to focus on maybe what some of the possible solutions or answers could be to the financial abuse we see, which is probably more common than we'd like to admit. Kitty was talking about some of the societal stresses on men um, and how that might relate to abuse. It begs an important question, you know, I wonder, is the answer to these problems more societal or more personal? Like, are we looking at legislative change? Are we looking at changing the way society looks at these things? Or is it more of you need to educate yourself personally about this situation so you don't end up in it? I think it's probably both. The thing that struck me, you know, even in reading Paula's thread is, I had this urge kind of bubbling up in myself and I'm sure other people felt that too of like, wow, I never thought something like this could happen to me. 
But if it could happen to Paula and my perceptions of Paula as a strong, independent woman, maybe I need to rethink that a little bit. Right. And I look at the way I was raised by a woman who was the breadwinner of the family. My dad was a stay at home dad. I've always worked for women. I've always been kind of, it's always, she, my mom drilled into my mind, like never let a man take care of you. She kind of gave me this fierce independence that I think kind of leads me to believe that something like this could never happen to me. And I was kind of confronted with that assumption pretty recently when I had an issue with my employer. And this is like not even really comparable, but it kind of gave me a a glimpse into how something like this might happen. I was with my employer for nine years. I was on the sales team slowly over time. I found myself as the only woman on this team. And they were doing this whole diversity and inclusiveness initiative. And it really opened a can of worms for me because I realized that I'm the only woman on this team. I'm one of the higher performers, and yet I am the lowest paid. And I took responsibility for that because I hadn't asked for a raise and I hadn't had a raise in three years. Like that's on me for not asking. But when I brought this to my employer's attention and said, hey, can we talk about pay parity as a part of this overall conversation? I realized in that moment that I was being held to a much higher standard than my male colleagues. And my boss definitely instilled some doubt in me. Like maybe I shouldn't be paid what I think I should be paid. Maybe I'm, I am being too demanding. Maybe I'm overstating my accomplishments, which it's dollars and cents, right? I'm a salesperson. I can point to how much money I've brought in and I can see what all of the other money that everybody else is bringing in. So it's a pretty black or white comparison of the value that I bring, but he definitely had me doubting myself and I can just see how that level of the, the, the kind of tiny manipulations that have to happen internally and for you to have that level of self-doubt that slowly this can happen to you over time really struck me as, okay, I need to be aware of this. You know, I need to be aware of like autonomy over my own mind and my own self-worth and not allow external forces to, to allow me to doubt myself in that way. Kitty, Diana speaks about this autonomy, specifically self-autonomy when it comes to her worth. But when I listen to her example, you know, I have to think that the gender pay gap and the glass ceiling, in a sense, are society acquiescing in financial abuse. I mean, we talk about it as if it is not common or we don't hear about it that often, but it's a perfect example of how society commits a similar abuse. And it's something we fairly accept. Doc, you are speaking my radical language today. Yes, (laughs) I absolutely agree that there are so many things that we just accept as normal about the way that we pay people, about the way that people get and earn and keep and invest money that we just like take it as like, well, yeah, that's how that works. But if I were sort of like designing the world from scratch and I showed you, all right, this is my rough draft for how, for how the world is going to work. I'm going to make it so that for example, when people pay taxes, I'm going, I as the government will know how much money they owe me, but I'm going to make them guess how much money it is. And I'm going to charge them more money if they're wrong. And I'm going to make it very difficult to understand instead of just sending them a bill. What do you think? Like, no, no one thinks that's a great <laughs> idea. And I, I think that is completely how the, the system um, can be changed. I think that the number one thing that we could do to like a concrete action that would greatly eliminate instances of financial abuse in a sort of indirect way would be pay transparency in the workplace. Every American worker with a tiny, tiny, tiny exception, such as like religious schools, that sort of thing, the vast majority of, of American companies, you, it is, you have a constitutionally protected right to state how much money you're making and to discuss that fact with your coworkers. And so many people think that they could get in trouble, they could get fired, they could be scolded for sharing that information. And that is absolutely not true. But employers absolutely use 
your the, that like ambiguity and that misconception to their advantage to continue to pay people less money than they're worth. If everyone knew and was open about how much money everyone else was making, I feel like it would do so much to topple this this tabooness that we have invested in 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 money and it's the tabooness of talking about money that makes it such an effective tool for a manipulative abusive person or entity to creep in and take from you so that's like yes i i completely agree like there's a lot that we could do on an interpersonal level i think paul is doing that as she's sharing stories it's it's giving people a lot to think about it's giving people things to watch for and and eroding misconceptions but at a societal level there's so much actual concrete not very difficult stuff we could be doing and i think if i could just do one pay transparency that would make a huge difference Diana Kitty is talking about societal change, but one of the things that's really disheartening to me as I read this Twitter thread is the legal boundaries set up that were really enforcing this financial abuse. Is the legal system somewhat at fault? And do we need legal changes or legislative changes to our legal system to start protecting victims of financial abuse? Oof, that's a loaded question, Doc. Yeah, I mean, it seems... Like in the what Paula described, she had put her assets in this other person's name. And so going to court, it's like she doesn't really have a lot of recourse. And so I wonder if there could be some kinds of protections in cases of manipulation, where if you can prove the manipulation that you know, this transfer of assets could be reevaluated based on the conditions that that transfer happened under. That seems to me that that stood out to me from from Paula's thread. And I could just feel her frustration that, you know, it's again, put on the 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 victim that, hey, you put yourself in this situation, you transferred the assets. Yeah, but w- under what conditions were those assets transferred? Can we have a, a more holistic picture of this dynamic versus just, you know, looking at whose name is on the paperwork? Yeah, I, I'll also throw out, I think even if, ideally, my understanding is that if you if you go to court, and you have a strong case and you speak to a judge or a jury about about your case, ideally, they're going to hear you. They're going to see your evidence and they're going to go, yeah, you know what? This 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 doesn't make sense. Why would this be his asset when here's all this documentation you provided that proves that this is something you built and, and, and earned on your own? I think at the interpersonal level, even if we don't have to go in and like change and strengthen these laws what we need to do is make sure that those judges those jury members those those attorneys they have the kind of familiarity that we're talking about exactly on this topic the idea that hey maybe the person who appears to be powerful in this situation really isn't maybe this relationship that seems to be so great on the outside maybe it really isn't widening the the conception of what abuse looks like on a person to person level would do so much to make the enforcement of laws fairer because people like Paula can then sit down in front of judges and juries and attorneys who have some idea of the the unfortunately rich tapestry of what a victim and, and an abuser can look like. And as long as we're kind of stuck in these little pigeonholes of what we think an abused person looks and acts like and what an abuser looks and acts like, will make it harder to mete out justice when it's merited. Specifically, Kitty, I think we have to recognize this idea that you can be both powerful and smart and still be a victim of abuse. Exactly. I Because if you described, I, I don't know anything about, and I don't want to speculate at all about who this other person that Paul is in, in litigation with is, but if you were to describe, okay, so this is a, a very independent a woman, she she builds a, a media empire teaching other people, especially women, about how to take control of their finances. And she's 
she's entrepreneurial and she's really smart and she's really confident and she's she's famous like she can just go anywhere and people will stop her and want to talk to her i'm like yeah that sounds like a really powerful person i would assume that that if she was in a bad relationship she, she could just walk away she if she someone was asking for something from her that she didn't want to give that she could just give him the middle finger and say goodbye so yeah it's it it truly is shocking but like many of the people who who end up being victims of abuse i think maybe are in the most difficult position to talk about it because their peers don't expect it from them and that adds to the shame like i should i should be better than this i shouldn't be the one who who is making this kind of mistake i should be the one who is a good example to others it it really like creates this feedback loop where i would never think if like a, if a friend with the vibe that that paula has was in a relationship i would never think like i should check in on her i should make sure she's doing well I, it just wouldn't occur to me so it it makes you even more isolated and being isolated is is what keeps the abuse going Let's take a short break. We're talking to Kitty from Bitches Get Riches and Diane and Miriam from the Economy Conference. And the topic for today is financial abuse against women. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. Are you enjoying listening to the Earn and Invest podcast every Monday and Thursday? Well, if you are, there's a place you can go to continue the conversation. That is the Earn and Invest Facebook group. Go to earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. There, we as a community come together to talk about what's happening in our world, whether it be current events, personal finance, the economy, you name it, we discuss it there. We'd love to hear from you. Check us out, earnandinvest.com slash Facebook and become a part of our community. Diane, as the conversation goes on, I get stuck with this idea of how do we make this better? And specifically, how do people protect themselves from getting in this situation? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think just like any abuse, it's about control. So can we be more mindful about those red flags that pop up as signs of control? You know, or is your partner overly jealous? Do they want to take a look at your text messages? Are they asking for, you know, really personal details too early in a relationship? You know, what are those red flags of general abuse that kind of manifest over time so that we're more mindful of, of how this dynamic evolves? So not to be too self-promotional, but we do have an article about financial abuse. And and in particular, one of the things that that I did that I think was really useful to a lot of folks was I kind of pulled out, here's a list of behaviors that are just a green light. It is good if your partner, for example, wants to talk openly and honestly with you about their financial goals. Ding, that's the green light. Awesome. Always good. And then there's stuff that's red light. Never. No, no, no. Run far away. Very, very fast. And that's stuff like as soon as you get your paycheck saying, hey, give me your money and I'm going to keep it and you can't have control to it. Like, obviously, that no, that is very wrong. That is very bad. The thing is that abusers and, and Diana is so right about this. They don't jump from like one to the other. It's a very slow uptick in in the level of control. And they're very clever with how they do it. Abusers, they they test with other things. And if you call them out, then they'll say, whoa, 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 I was just choking. Can't you take a choke? Oh my gosh, you're so serious. And now suddenly you're the problem. Like it, it, they're very clever about how they do it. So what I did was I, I made a list of here's the stuff that's the yellow light. So maybe they're not, maybe they're not immediately taking your paycheck, snatching it right out of your hands. But are they saying like, yeah, can I borrow some money and I'll pay you back? And they do pay you back, but they're a week late on it. That to me is like, okay, there are situations where that might happen where, you know, it's a totally benign, just one of those things that happens over the course of a long relationship, nothing to worry about. It could be that, but it could also be that they're throwing out this little test. If I say 
I'm going to use something of yours and give it back to you. And I do give it back to you, but I give it back to you late. I'm going to sit back and see how you react to that. Do you do you get angry? Do you insist on having a conversation? Do you change and and the way that we've managed finances together in the past and say, whoa, this is this is serious to me. This matters. Okay, that's this person showing me that this tactic isn't going to work on them. Let me move on and try another one. Or, you know, let me let me try it again and see if I can wear them down over time to the point where I can control them. So I think there are many rather benign behaviors in that sort of yellow light zone where it might be someone trying to control you because they truly care about you and they don't have a, a robust toolkit of how to do that. If I see someone, you know, if I saw my partner, for example, struggling to chop food, if he was just really bad at that, which he's not, but if he was just like massacring a carrot, my instinct might be to kind of gently push him aside and say, here, let me do that. Now I'm doing that because I love him and I see he's struggling and I, and I, and I don't want him to struggle. But my first impulse there is ultimately controlling. I'm not teaching him how to chop a dang carrot, which he's a grown man. He would certainly be able of be capable of learning how to do that if he did not already know. So there are controlling behaviors that do come from a place of love or a place of, I, I want things to be better for you and I'm frustrated and, and I just want to help you. And it requires a lot of self-knowledge and a lot of strong observational skills and truly thinking deeply and in general, just unfortunately life experiences to learn what the difference is. And I think when you see those yellow flags, trying to figure out where is this coming from? Is this coming from a place of love for me? Or is it coming out of the abuser's anxieties, fears, sense of being out of control of themselves and wanting to control me because I am easier to control than themselves. It sounds like this recognizing this idea of preparing the victim, which we see in all sorts of sexual abuse, all sorts of things over time, is that the abuser slowly works their way into the behavior so it almost feels normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's never like the the most common idea of like a sexual assault, for example, for many, many, many years, I think this has finally started to change. It was the idea of like a lady walking alone down down an alley and and some some guy just pops out and goes, ha ha, gotcha. And the the reality that that works against that that narrative works against is that most people know their abusers. Most people are are either dating or related to, or friends with the person who rapes them. So understanding the ways in which like, when it, it, it's almost become a bit of a cliche, but a really useful phrase for me has always been when, sh when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. And in general, I think if you see someone acting in a way that shows that they desire a high amount of control someone who shows that they're angry, someone who shows that they're not honest, um, someone who shows that they are constantly the victim. And oh, I'm always the victim. Why are, why are you yelling at me and holding me accountable for my actions when I'm the victim? Don't you know that? Any of those kinds of behaviors, I'm like, mm, I don't think you're going to show me less of this behavior as we get to know each other better. I think you're going to show me more of it. And if you are with someone who is genuinely like, a kind and supportive and loving person. I, my personal experience is that that kindness, that lovingness, that supportiveness only deepens and grows as you get to know them. So really noticing and consciously saying, I am noticing something that I don't like in, in my friend or my partner or my employer or anyone who is in a position to abuse you and say like, I'm really going to notice this and I'm going to evaluate it step by step and see how I feel. And if I think this is progressing in a negative direction, I'm going to give myself the permission to not have to stick around and find out how bad it can get. Diana, is the simple answer just to keep your finances separate? I mean, plenty of married people nowadays have their own bank accounts, et cetera. I mean, is that the answer? I know for me, it's my preference. And I don't know if that's you know, driven by, again, it's been drilled into my head since I was a little girl. 
that I always have to have my own money. To me, money creates options. Money is security. I feel pretty strongly for myself that I want to have separate finances. I don't, I don't know that that's the right fit for everyone. I do think there are a lot of marriages where it works really well to combine finances, but you know, I also, I think that seeing this dynamic of financial abuse, seeing so many women talk about how they feel stuck in toxic marriages because they don't have the resources to leave. I just feel strongly for myself that I, I never really want to be in that position or have money be the reason that I stay. Kitty, has the pandemic changed the situation? I mean, a lot of people regarded the recession associated with the pandemic as a she session. Do you think that there is more financial abuse based on what's been happening in the world in the last year? I really wish that I didn't know so with so much clarity what my answer to this is. So one of the things that we we do pretty commonly is we're we're very active on Tumblr where our followers can ask us anonymous questions. And overall I would say that Tumblr skews pretty young. And during the pandemic, the number of people who reached out to us to say, I am stuck living with a partner or a in a family dynamic that is abusive. And I, I literally cannot leave. What do I do? And that those questions really kept Piggy and I up at night as we were receiving them and doing our very best to answer them. But yeah, the sad reality is that I think anytime there's an economic recession, anytime there is <laughs> certainly global pandemics, anytime there's a lot of economic instability in the world, you're creating situations where people have fewer options. And the reality of that is, is unfortunately pretty scary because many abusers are, are very acutely aware that they can take even greater liberties because the person that they're abusing does not have an alternative. Yeah, that's my really sad answer to that. It is very sad. And I actually, as you were talking, want to alter my last answer to that question of if the finances should always be separate. I don't know that they should always be separate, but if they are combined, I do think it's important for both parties to be fully aware of where all the accounts are you know, both names are on the deed to the house, you know, those kind of things. Cause I, I think the lack of awareness of what even the financial situation is can lead to a lot of abuse. I've seen a number of posts of women saying, you know, I don't even know where to start because I don't know where all the money is, how much there is, you know, if some is being hid somewhere. So I think, you know, having those monthly quarterly family meetings where you're looking at all of the finances collectively and both parties are fully aware of the financial situation is a great place to start. A hundred percent. And actually, you know, I, I think this is probably true for a lot of people who are like big into personal finance as a topic. I like money. I, I enjoy being the one who is good with money in, in my partnership. And I will sometimes like you know, make a, a a decision without consulting my partner because it's in line with the goals that we've already, you know, talked about. Like when I notice, hey, we got a little extra money in our saving account, I'm just going to pop it over to our investment account. I, I may or may not let him know about that. But I think the fact that, you know, we, we do have like the quarterly couples like financial check-in where we say like, how do we feel about our goals? What do we want to do next with our money? He is informed in a big picture sense of everything. And his name is on every account. He has every login. His his phone is is on the two-factor authentication. So we always even know when we're going into the into the apps and moving things around. And I I was talking with him just before we were recording this. I was kind of ranting about financial abuse <laughs> as he's just sitting there like, I'm trying to eat cereal, but okay, I will listen to you talk about this. And I was like, you know. If you, if I wanted to financially abuse you, all I would have to do is wait for you to go into the shower. I know there's not a lock on your phone. I can just go in, change a couple of your passwords, go into your email and delete the password notification changes. Like 
and done. I have access to everything in 10 minutes. Technology has made it so much easier, I think, for for people to connect with each other and see these like big pictures instantly of everything. But it's also in uh, the flip side is that it's made it easier to control people. And that is something that like with that level of trust that he and I have with each other, where he knows I'm not going to take his phone and just steal all of his money while he's trying to trying to lather up. With that comes an obligation on my end to always be completely transparent and say, here's all my logins. Like anytime you want to go in and see what, what, you know, what tweaks I've made to our stock bond, you know, ratio for, for this month or whatever, he can see all of that at any time. And trust requires transparency. So Kitty, last word, and I'll ask Diana the same thing next. If you're listening to this episode right now and saying, wow, I clearly am a victim of financial abuse. What do you think is the first step? Like, what do people do once they come to this momentous conclusion that they're in the midst of this problem? I think the most important thing is to, above instant reaction, above taking any sort of like immediate steps to get out of this situation, the most important thing is to really internalize what you have discovered because you may have this moment of clarity, right? But you are living cheek to cheek with someone who is deeply invested in convincing you that this insight about yourself that you just had is not correct, that you made it up, that you're crazy, that you're such a difficult person. You're always, you know, making everything about you and you're just trying to be the victim, blah, blah, blah. These are the things that this person is going to try to teach to you to get you to let go of this new awareness. So the first thing I would say you do before you start making escape plans, before you, you, you know, start to plan how to get out of this, the most important thing is to really deeply internalize that you are not wrong and this is indeed what's happening to you and that you deserve better. And from there, probably the first thing I would do is reach out to that person who you know is going to help help you be accountable and help you not get convinced that this new insight that you have is just you being crazy. That's what I would say first. Diana, first steps, if you're listening to this and saying, oh my God, that's me. I 100% agree with Kitty. Immediately when you asked the question, I thought you got to get support because if you're in a situation where you're being manipulated, you know, it's almost like this other person has their hooks in your thoughts. And so you may not be in a position to fully trust yourself yet. And I think if you can be supported as you're working through it, you'll have other people that can kind of reinforce, you know, a position of strength for you. So like, for example, and again, I don't think this is immediately comparable, but with my situation with my employer, I was thinking that I was, I was really doubting myself. Maybe I'm wrong to, you know, these claims of discrimination and this, all this information that came to light that made me realize that I need to get out of this situation and I'm not being treated fairly. I mean, my friends and my support system really showed up for me in that moment. And I mean, hours on the phone, a lot of tears, a lot of emotional labor to work through it. You have to be supported through that. So, and there are tons of resources out there for women. There are financial therapists there, are, you know, there's a lot of support out there. So to me, that, that is what I would do if I found myself in that situation. And as I would, I would really seek out help. Well, and one other thing, Diana, that you just made me think of is one of the things that abusers love to do is to isolate you from your friends, from your family, especially if they get the sense that like, yo, I don't think her sister likes me very much. So I'm going to, I'm going to work to undermine this relationship and try to try to make it so that they're not as close as they used to be. That's something that abusers and manipulators love to do. So it may be that you're in a situation where you're like, I haven't talked to my closest friend in six months, or I had a big blow up, you know, with my family over, over this guy, you may be in a position where you feel like I don't have 
someone that I can reach out to. Just know like this, this is like the real sisterhood moment right now. Just know no matter how we left things, no matter what the last conversation we had was, no matter how long ago it was, no matter if it was a fight, call us anyway, reach out. Like we, we had those, those fights and, and your abuser pushed us away because we love you because we care about you. So don't let that sense of isolation make you feel like you can't reach out and ask uh, your ride or dies for help because we are here. I guarantee it. I also wanted to remind everybody that if you find yourself in this situation, this type of abuse comes together with other types of abuse. And I guess one of the first things you should do is secure your own physical safety. So make sure if you are in a physically or sexually abusive situation that, that you get those resources and ask for the help you need even before getting to the financial piece, because we want to make sure everybody's okay. A hundred percent. Great point, Doc. All right. Well, I want to end this episode the way we end every episode. I know that this has been a difficult conversation, but an important one. I'm going to start with Kitty. Tell us what is up next in your life and where can we find you if we want to know more? Yeah. So you can find us at bitchesgetriches.com. We are in the middle of producing season three of our podcast. If you want to go back and listen to seasons one and two, you can find them wherever you're listening to stuff. And I think what's next for us, we are actually taking the big step of hiring staff, which is really scary. Speaking of like transparency and 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 trust, it's really scary to realize that like, oh, hey, we're ready to have an admin. Oh my God, that means we have to give them like our passwords and stuff. And they can just read every every G chat we've ever had over the six years that we've been doing this. So it's uh, it's pretty scary. It will require a lot of trust, but it's a step we're pretty excited about. And I'm happy to say uh, that we are practicing what we preached. We said up front, here is our budget. Here is what we can pay. So we we're trying to to not be hypocrites and and uh, live our truth. And Diana, I believe Kitty and her co-host Piggy will be speakers at the Economy Conference. Hell yeah, up. we will be. Woo! Oh my gosh, I'm so excited about this. Well, as you know, Economy speakers are required to be as entertaining as they are informative. So Bitches Get Rich is definitely fits that bill. And I'm, I'm super excited to have them on board. But yeah, that's what's up next for me. The Economy Conference is scheduled for this November 13th and 14th at the University of Cincinnati. It is crazy to think that, okay, it's five months away, but I know that's going to go by in a blink of an eye. So I am just, you know, preparing all the logistics for the event, solidifying the speaker lineup and selling tickets. So you can check that out at economyconference.com and economy is spelled with an M E not an M Y. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I wanted to thank Kitty and Diana. That's a wrap. If you or someone you love is a victim of financial or domestic abuse, please take action now. You can always call the Domestic Violence Hotline. That's 1-800-799-7233. Again, that's the Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. Also, there's some resources for people facing financial abuse. The Office of Women's Health at womenshealth.gov. Again, that's womenshealth.gov is one place to go. Another is Women's Law. Org. These are two resources for people who feel like they are in the midst of financial abuse. Check them out. Otherwise, please get help. Now, I'm going to keep things going just for the after discussion. If you guys have anything you want to talk about or anything we missed, anyone also in listening at the moment, if they want to come up on stage and ask a question, just request Kitty and Diana, anything we didn't cover in this episode that you want to talk about? I, I mean, I, I think we, we threw out a lot of really good stuff. Um, I think uh, maybe a great thing to include in, in the show notes or, or whatever might be a, a couple of hotlines. Um, there's, there's some uh, very good ones, um, even for folks who are maybe not quite ready to leave yet but just kind of want someone to talk to. Um, there, are, there are lots of um, 
a, a big range of everything from like emergency shelters, like when you need to flee for your life versus like, I'm just sort of coming to grips with the fact that I'm in a crappy relationship. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thanks, Doc G, for putting this together and just bringing attention and awareness to this issue. Because what strikes me the most is it's just something that's not talked about enough. Mm -hmm. And so by bringing attention and awareness to it, I think, um, you know, goes a long way. So thank you so much for putting this together. Yeah, I'm like a moth to the flame. When I see stuff like this, like I can't. I can't turn away just because I think it's so important. And I know it's not everyone's favorite thing to talk about. And certainly it's not always joyous or happy, but I feel like uh, we'd be remiss to turn our heads when someone has gone so far out on the limb to tell us about something so important. I feel like if we turn our heads and ignore it or acknowledge it and move on, then we've done that person as well as the issue a huge disservice. Agreed. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's one of the wonderful things about having some type of platform. It's not the biggest in the world, but it's a platform nonetheless. And so to me, it's important to bring these things to light as much as I can. I, I think one of the things about like abuse and coming out about it afterwards, that's pretty hard to wrap your head around is like how much you have to continue to invest in this failed relationship if you want to see justice done, it's sometimes it's easier to, you know, in in a case like Diana's, um, if, if your workplace has just like taken some of the, uh, some of your best working years from you and, and given you so little consideration in return, you have the option to like, I'm going to take you to court. I'm going to do my best to like prove that this is my case and that it wasn't right and that what happened to me shouldn't have happened to me and that it's your fault. And you have that option, but that also means I'm going to continue to give this, this company or this relationship or whatever, a bunch of my, my mental space, a bunch of my time, a bunch of my money. Um, and that's a really tough thing for people to commit to. And I don't think less of anyone who decides like, you know what, the best thing for me is to just move on and stop giving this any any space in my life to this. Um, so I, I agree. I really applaud um, Paula for making what's probably the harder choice to to pursue justice and, and to not be silent because um, being silent is sometimes easier um, in, in a way that is really unfortunate, but also really easy to understand when you think it through. Yeah, talking about justice in 2021 is is just exhausting, right? Because it feels like these last few years, it's become so clear that justice is something that we're not always good at in this country. Um, Maybe not in this world, but certainly not in this country. Uh, On the other hand, it's that fatigue that makes me think we almost have to double down and pay more attention. uh, Because again, life is telling us something. What we're experiencing is happening. And again, just ignoring it to me is we do it at our own peril. Snap, snap, snap. Totally agreed. All right. Well, Diana, on something happier, tell me how excited you are for economy, because I know I'm looking at your speaker list and I'm so excited. I'm driving again. So I'm going to drive up from Cincinnati uh, up to Cincinnati. uh, And I cannot wait to see everybody. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uh You know, it's really interesting planning this during COVID because in some ways it's harder logistically, but in other ways it's so much easier because the first one, it took me 20 months to plan the first one. And so, and it's not like I had a blog or a podcast or any kind of following. It was just like straight hustle trying to convince poor folks like you to work with me. (laughs) You didn't have to convince much. It was a lot of fun. No, it's really, uh, it's humbling how much support I was able to get from the community and um, just to be able to to do it again and make improvements and kind of expand on the vision is is super exciting. Um, As you know, Joe Saul Sihai is one of the speakers and we're actually doing a live show of the Stephanie yes, Benjamin show. Yes, I'm very excited about that. And that's, yeah. that's great for both of us because it's helping him prepare for his tour. But then as far as my programming, like 
it gives the attendees something to do on Friday night leading into Saturday, which is like the main time for the show. Um, last year we didn't have that. It was just kind of, everybody came in on Friday night, did their own thing. And then the show started Saturday morning. So it, it's awesome to be able to, to add that to our programming. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. And I know that uh, one of the things about economy last year being your debut, it was so amazingly well produced. So given the fact that you now have one of them under your belt, I just can't wait to see what this year's going to look like. Uh, for anyone listening right now, Economy Conference, it's what, in November, it's going to be really great. Well, thank you so much.